Hello friends, welcome back to the class of Old Testament Prophets. Today we will learn about Prophet Mika and his prophetical book. Let's begin. Mika is the fourth and the last prophet of the 8th century prophets. During most of the part of 8th century, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah prospered both politically and economically. Though the kings, nobles and business people had become rich and the poor had become poorer during, due to corruption. The 8th century leaders recognized this and pointed it out, calling the people back to the covenant with Yahweh and righteousness. Their message had three strands, social sins, religious sins and political sins. At the beginning of 8th century, Hosea and Amos ministered and towards the end of the 8th century, Isaiah and Micah ministered. By this time, Assyria had become powerful and both the kingdoms had become its vassal. Let's look into the life of Prophet Micah. Very less information is found about Micah except what is mentioned in chapter 1 verse 1. He is from the country of Moreshet Gath which is 21 miles southwest of Jerusalem. As Micah came from the countryside, he saw things from the agricultural point of view, especially regarding the social sins on farmers by the wealthy. He sympathized with the farmers, shepherds and small holders and small holders like Amos. He was not influenced by the pomp and the show and the facade of the new urban culture which was symbolized by fine houses, fashion, quick money, business, etc. He was grounded with moral and ethical realities that make a nation truly great. He prophesied to the southern kingdom between 750 BC to 686 BC during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, hence was a contemporary of Hosea, and Isaiah for a while. The first two marks of a genuine prophet can be seen in the chapter 1 and verse 1. Let's look at the political and the religious scenario. Israel and Syria had joined hand against Assyria, the rising power, and wanted Judah also to join them. Ahaz, the king of Judah, rejected the proposal and requested Assyria to help Judah against Israel and Syria. This made Judah, Assyria's vassal state, sending him gold, silver and treasuries. He even built an altar in Jerusalem like the one in Assyria and the chief priest Urijah accepted it. Hezekiah, the next king of Judah, cleansed, the Jer cleansed Jerusalem of the temple and revolted against Assyria. He failed in the first attempt but succeeded in the second with God's help. The division of the book. Micah chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 2 verse 13 talks about exile and restoration. Chapter 3 verse 1 to chapter 5 verse 15 talk about Judah's fall and restoration. Micah chapter 6 verses 1 to chapter 7 verse 20 talks about the conclu concluding indictment, lament and promise. Micah chapter 1 verse 1 to 16. Micah's message to the two cities. Micah 1, chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. He begins with the two commands, hear and listen. He addresses everyone, everywhere, to all the nations to pay attention to God. He describes the nature of God as the Lord and judge of the world who has witnessed their sins against them and as the sovereign Lord who has come, who, ca who comes from his holy temple or his holy place, holy dwelling place. Thus, he is seen in both militarily and political dimensions and the spiritual and the religious dimensions. God is against apostasy and in control of human armies and kingdoms. Secondly, uh, thirdly, the Lord of nature. He controls nature and destruction and all the natural calamities. Behind the Assyrian armies, uh, behind the Assyrian armies, Micah sees the invincible march of God. 
Mika chapter 1 verses 5 to 7. What is the reason for this terrible judgment? Mika states that the reason can be in the capital cities of Samaria and Jerusalem. The false worship, apostasy and idolatry are the sins of the house of Israel. After, starting, after stating the reason of judgment, Mika prophesies the fall of Samaria which was fulfilled by the Assyrians in 722 BC. The reasons for the destructions are three sins. Firstly, the reliance on their own wealth and power instead of God. They felt proud and secure because of their strategic locations and the luxurious palace and city of stones they built and lived in. Hence, the city of Samaria will be completely destroyed and turned into rubble. Second sin is the religious sins of apostasy and idolatry, like the sin of Jeroboam. Hence, all their idols will be destroyed. The third sin is the spiritual adultery and temple prostitution. This could also refer to the political sins of paying tributes to other nations and making alliances with them rather than trusting God. Hence, God will punish them financially. Mika 1, 8-9 As the prophet of God, Mika feels that the divine agony here for his people. He describes himself as a hollowing jekyll and a mourning ostrich and or owl for them. He will go around barefoot and naked in mourning. For Samaria is incurably doomed and the doom is approaching the gates of Jerusalem, his people. God grieves over the destruction, but he loves, but his love cannot be without justice. Micah chapter 1 verses 10 to 16. Here Micah addresses the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem about the destruction of Samaria and invites them to mourn for their children or the cities and villages around Jerusalem which would suffer a Syrian attack. Referring to some of these cities and towns around Jerusalem, Micah makes use of the wordplay in this message. Let's note some of the following examples. We'll see the word, its meaning in Hebrew and how Mika plays with it. Gath is a place. It means tell, but Mika uses, at, uses as tell it not. Beth Opera is a place. It means house of dust, but Mika uses it as roll the dust. Shafir means pleasant, but Mika uses it, uses it as nakedness and shame. Zanan, which means come out. But Mika plays with it and says, those there will not dare to come out and the house in the fear of judgment. Then we see Beth Ezel, which means house adjourning. Mika again plays with it and says, they are mourning alone as their protection has been removed. Then we have Maroth, which means bitter. Mika says, their life is bitter as they wait for their expected relief that does not come as the Assyrian army reaches the gates of Jerusalem, so it cannot help them. Next, we can see Lachish, which means team. But, uh, but he says, harness a team to a chariot to escape. Then we see Exib, which means deception or lying. But Micah uses it as, the town will prove deceptive to the kings of Israel, like a brook that dries up in summer. Then we see lastly, Marisha which means conqueror. He uses it as God will bring conqueror, Sennacherib, to them. Micah chapter 2 verses 1 to 13. He is a preacher for these people. After the two oracles against Judah and Israel, Micah now turns to a particular, uh, 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 to it particularly and about its sin. He addresses a particular group of people the wealthy landlords and deals with a particular sin committed by them which is illegal appropriation of land by the oppressing poor. The basis for this sin is as mentioned by Mika is greed and covetousness which means the breach of the 10th commandment of the Lord. Mika chapter 2 verses 1 to 2 During the, monar during the monarchy the gap between the rich and the poor had widened 
This created a class of absentee landlords who lived luxuriously in the capital cities while the peasants lived on their lands for a pittance. Mika mentions five areas regarding this sin. Covetousness and breaking of the 10th commandment. Defrauding the poor using power. Poor lost their livelihood and their means to livelihood. Small landowners lost not only their livelihood but also their inheritance which should have been passed on to their children. Disobedience of God's laws. As the land was not meant to be sold, in Jubilee a year it was to be returned to the owners. Thus it can be seen that it was sin, it was sin legally, financially, spiritually and ethically. This was never how God desired his people to be. Mika called this wickedness iniquity and evil as they plan the as they plan the evil act all night when honest men are sleeping and execute it in the morning mika chapter 2 verse 3 to 5 here mika talks about their punishment and the problem or reason for their sin as stated by god for punishment god plans disaster for these people as they planned evil against the poor the problem or the reason is the pride and the lack of fear in God. Therefore, God says in chapter 2 verse 3, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks and you shall not walk haughtily for it will be a time of disaster. The land they stole will be taken away by powerful nations. The land Though it is important for them, they should not trust on their riches and strength, but in the Lord. Mika chapter 2 verse 6 to 11. Here Mika shifts his focus on, uh, on the false prophets. These false prophets were employed by wealthy landlords. As Mika refuses to join them and oppose them, they advise him firstly to stick to the religious matters like worship and relationship with God. But Stay away from the daily behavior and work ethics like fraud, corruption, marketplace issues. Secondly, they rebuke him. They rebuke his prophecy about imminent disaster and judgment, stating that this will never happen. And what does Mika know about property and finances? To this, Mika replies, asks them, Should this be said, O house of Jacob, has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? Mika goes on to point out four more sins of the wealthy people. They have become like enemy to the people of God. Rob all the innocent they come across and none are safe of their covetousness. The peaceful have lost their cloak and blankets or their coverings. By this, they are abused by the, uh, the law given in, they have abused the law given in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 10 to 13. The women, especially the widows, have been driven from their homes in loans after their husband's death. The blessings and the inheritance of the children have been taken away from them. This probably refers to the orphans which, have, which was against the commands given in Exodus 22 verses 22 to 23. Lastly, he comments on the false preachers and calls their preachings not from God but utter wind and lies. Mika chapter 2 verses 12 to 13. Mika preaches of the future hope. Despite of the coming disaster, there is still hope because God is faithful. He prophesies about the military campaign by Sennacherib in 701 BC where Samaria and the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed. Yet there is a hope for the remnants. He uses few rural, example, few rural examples to portray this picture as a shepherd leads the sheep in safety into their pen and into the pasture lands. It is a light beyond the tunnel. Mika chapter 3 verses 1 to 12. Mika's message to the leaders. In Mika's times, the structure of the Judean society was falling apart. Now, he has three short warnings or oracles to three different groups of leaders. 
each linked to justice. First, the absence of justice in the courts. Mika begins the oracle by addressing those responsible for upholding and enforcing the law, the judges, the magistrates of the city, the tribes of the nation who were authorized to settle disputes and make important decisions. They were neglecting their important duties, protecting the vulnerable in the community, of protecting the vulnerable in the community. The slaves, Hebrew servants, the poor, the women, the strangers, the widows and the orphans, etc. The courts had become corrupt and injustice had become their normalcy. He uses a strong metaphor for this in verses 2 to 3. You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them like meat in a pot like flesh in a cauldron. But God is God of justice and will hear the cries of the innocent. And those who do justice, they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. Second, the absence of justice in the popular prophets. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when, when they have something to eat, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war when, uh, when, uh, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouth. The prophets favor the rich. Mika questions these false prophets and condemns their teachings. He questions their true vocation and relationship with God and says that their gifts will be taken away and they will have to turn to the forbidden occult practices and divination. The seers will be disregard, disgraced and the diviners put to shame and they shall cover their lips and there is no answer from God. But Mika is filled with the power of God to see justice and might of God prevail and to declare the transgressions and sins of Judea, which is the true vocation of a prophet or preacher. The third is the absence of justice in the govern government. Here Mika calls out to all the leaders and strongly denounces them. Hear this, you heads of the houses of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight. Injustice was rampant everywhere. The rulers were living luxurious, in luxurious homes at the expense of the poor. The judges demanded bribes. The priests were charging high for teaching word, teaching God's word. And the prophets told fortunes for money. All this is done with great but false religiosity and prevalent sickness of injustice stating, is not, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. These promises were false and Micah declares Israel's complete destruction. Because of King Hezekiah's wise heed to the message, the destruction was delayed. Micah chapter 4 verses 1 to, 1 to chapter 5 verse 15. Micah's message to the future. Micah now moves on to state the prospects of glorious future that God had for Jerusalem. Mika mentions three periods and about the distant future, middle era and the present prophecy of the latter days with in the that day and now. Mika chapter 4 verses 1 to 5. The vision is set in the latter days. It shall not come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and it shall be lifted up above the hills and the people shall flow to it. This is the same mountain, Zion, which at the end of the third chapter was to be ploughed like a field and was overgrown with thickets, fit only for marauding animals. But now this is the same mountain, Jerusalem will become the city of peace. People will flock there to learn because instead of injustice and strife, there will be peace. Their weapons will be turned into farming tools. None will starve. None will fear justice, equality and peace will prevail. Mika chapter 4 verses 6 to 8. 
now mika moves to tell moves on to tell god tell how god will make it happen mika chapter 4 verse 6 to 5 verse 1 has three short oracles first oracle restoration and dominion this talks of the future in the day uh, this talks of the future in that day which links to the latter days where god talks about the restoration of his remnants post war chaos in that day declares the lord i will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom i have afflicted and the lame i will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation and the lord will reign over them in the mount zion from this time forth and forevermore he talks about the restoration of the lame and exiles for those without hope or strength it is interesting to read that god is going to restore israel with the lame who were not allowed to enter into the holy of holies but we do see its reversal in the ministry of jesus the second thing to note is that the mighty nation is reduced to ragged remnant whom god will use for his purpose the lame might also refer may also refer to jacob being struck on his thigh in penuel which meant that he depend he had to depend and submit to god completely which showed god's reign in them in mount zion which was not the case in mika's times mika chapter 4 verses 9 5 to 11 5 and mika chapter 4 verse 9 to chapter 5 verse 1 now we look at the next two oracles here four times mika says now reflecting on the harsh reality of that time in comparison to the future prophecies for uh, the second uh, oracle is ruin and redemption judah is called the daughter of zion but here he brings forth the pain of a woman in labor for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country you shall go to babylon it is interesting to note that mika mentions babylon many years before when he when at present assyria was their enemy mika has already stated that they will not be defeated by assyrians like the northern kingdom was but they will cry aloud at the time of persecution as the woman in labor but they will have to remember and trust god who is their king and counselor who will be with her in exile will rescue and redeem her The third oracle is victory beyond defeat. The third oracle starts with the emphatic now when many nations join together and stand at Jerusalem's gate to loot and to destroy her. God promises res- to rescue them and punish the enemies. If this incident is of 701 BC then it is Sennacherib at the gates of siege which God overturned. This shows that God controls history and his power is thus ultimate. Israel may suffer defeat but God will rescue and revive them. Micah chapter 5 verses 2 to 5a. At this time of crisis Micah moves on to a positive note promising them a deliverer as and a new ruler. He will come from Bethlehem Ephrata, a tiny unknown place. so insignificant a town that it is not even mentioned among the 115 towns and cities of juda when joshua divided the land but this was the birthplace of the great king david and from where the future king would also come he would be the king over israel as a shepherd protect his people he is more than david whose origin is from old from the ancient days he is the universal ruler he will be their peace mika chapter 5 verse 5b to 15 there are three short oracles in this part deliverance from assyria this can be linked to the coming of the promised king it talks of the raising seven shepherds and eight princes to defeat assyria they will deliver the land of nimrod and deliver and deliver them this refers to the to how god miraculously delivered them from sennacherib second israel's bright prospects for the future 
if this was 701 BC, then only the remnant of Israel has survived as the northern kingdom has been destroyed and the ten tribes are lost, only two remain in the southern kingdom. They were now on the verge of collapse, but God had a bitter plan, better plan. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass. And the remnant of Jacob shall be like the lion, like a lion among the beasts of the forest. Mika affirms a future despite of calamities of the present. The third oracle, Israel's punishment. At the same time, in that day, God says, He will punish them in other ways. I will destroy is mentioned four times. And uproot is mentioned in verse 14. And this is how God is going to destroy the alien influences and the evil practices in them that took them away from God. The first, the urban self-sufficiency of depending on walled cities and strongholds. God would bring enemies who would lay siege on and scale the so-called high impregnable walls. The second, the military might, depending on horses and chariots and not on God. This referred to the chariot brigade of Lachish, despite of God's instructions of not bringing the horses and chariots from Egypt, they continued to do so and instead of trusting God, hence God would destroy them. The third, occult practices, which had been practiced by the prophets based on the heathen practices of the land of Canaan. The fourth, idol worship, God would destroy the carved images and the sacred stones and uproot the Asherah poles. God would destroy everything of this kind from the renewed Jerusalem and the people would obey him. Micah chapter 6 verses 1 to chapter 7 verse 7. A message of gloom and doom. Micah chapter 6 verses 1 to 8. Micah here creates an image of a courtroom where God brings charges and accusations against his people. Here, God himself is the judge as well as the plaintiff, bringing accusations against Israel and asking them to stand up and plead for their case. Mike Micah is God's counsel speaking on his behalf. God metaphorically calls the old mountains and hills to his witness and accusations against Israel as they know his faithfulness, but Israel does not. Israel has forgotten God and forsaken him, but he has not given up on them. So God asks his people, O oh my people, what have I done to you? And in what way have I wearied you? Interestingly, his accusations are not a list of crimes, sins, failures and shortcomings, but a plea from the father to his wayward children. God reminds them of how much he has done for them. His deeds are fourfold. When they were enslaved in Egypt, he gave them freedom. When they were without leaders, he gave them Moses, Aaron and Miriam. When King Balak, Balak threatened their existence in Moab, he rescued them again and from the curse of Balaam. When they crossed Jordan from Shittim to Gilgal, he was with them at every step guiding and protecting them and making them victorious. The defendant comes to the court in verse 6 to 7. Israel has no complaint and does not deny the accusations, but asks, what should I do to set myself right? Interestingly, she sees her hope more in religiosity, sacrifice of numerous animals and rivers of oil or even the sacrifice of their firstborn sons as the Canaanites. In fact, Mika says that they have lost their very essence of faith. Rituals had become the end of its, or in itself. The temple system had converted into national insurance policy rather than means to meet God. The priests pushed the cult as it brought them livelihood, while the prophets called the people back to the covenant. Mika in verse 8 does the same, states that God requires a good life, which has three parts. Do justice, 
Sacrifice was not the answer to injustice. Till injustice prevailed, temple worship was just a mockery. Second, love mercy. Loving kindness refers to the covenantal love or chesed love of God. It is linked with justice, but God goes beyond and penetrates both attitude and activities. It includes love for neighbor and also for the enemies. It emphasized on equal society linked to God and his gift of promised land with the provision of the land for the landless, treatment of poor and strangers, sharing with the poor at the harvest time. Third, walk humbly with your God. It was a daily walk in the relationship with God that like in the heart of the religion of Israel. Following God required ethics. So ethics becomes a matter of response and gratitude, not blind obedience. Mika therefore says that you must understand God as you know him and as he revealed himself to you as creator, as redeemer, father and judge and so enter into the into a personal and living and loving relationship with him in awe and humility. Mika chapter 6 verse 9 to 16. Mika now proclaims judgment on Israel in the marketplace. The voice of the Lord cries to the city and it and it is sound of wisdom and it is the sound wisdom to fear thy name. This portion first talks of the crimes of which his audience is guilty and then declares the judgment from God. Firstly, the crimes of commerce, the ill-gotten gains. There was a total corruption in business. The weighing scales were rigged, rigged. Uh, when the customer complained, they were threatened. Secondly, the punishment of the commercial crime. Sins for which God would destroy them. Food acquired illegally will not satisfy hunger. Profits through illegal transactions will be lost. Olives will be pressed but will not produce oil. Seeds will be sown but no harvest will be reaped. Grapes will be crushed but will produce no wine. These were the five curses mentioned earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 16 to 19. Mika chapter 7 verses 1 to 7. Here Mika moans in private for the fate of the nation. He cries, what Misery is mine. The sadness described here is like entering the orchard only to find no fruit to eat. No grapes remain, all gone, all gleaned, although they were asked to leave some behind for the poor. So it is Jerusalem where no honest people are left. Instead, they lie in wait to shed blood and are set to cheat and exploit their neighbors as a hunter awaits the prey. Those authorized to maintain justice take bribes and sell justice to benefit self and join hands with the evildoers. They are like prickly briars and thorns which will be burnt in fire in the coming destruction. Due to the prevalent evil in the society, all the normal relationships are destroyed. Neighbor, friend, relative or even sons and daughters cannot be trusted. Mika says, a man's enemies are the members of his own household, yet Mika will trust in the Lord and pray for him, pray for them. Mika chapter 7 verse 8 to 20 is a message of restoration and praise. Mika ends his book with a psalm, which is like a communal lament expressing grief for the present disaster and hope for a brighter future. This is a psalm used by Judah and Jerusalem who have experienced judgment in the present and look forward to a hope of a future. It falls in four sections. First, the lament of personified, the lament of personified city of Jerusalem. Second, the announcement spoken in the temple by a priest or prophet of God calling the people to rebuild the walls of the city. Third, the confidence of the people in restoration of their nation in sight of other nations and fourthly a hymn of praise to the Lord for his mercy and love. The Lord is light in the darkness as Mika says in chapter 7 verses 8 to 10. Here Jerusalem or Zion speaks to her enemies probably Nineveh or Babylon do not gloat over me my enemy. 
Here Zion speaks of the humiliation of defeat, but with the awareness that it is current disaster, condition in the result of God's punishment for sin. Yet in the midst of it overtones of a hope of anticipation of mercy can be seen beyond the experience of judgment. The most painful gloat of enemy was, where is the Lord your God? Which reflects the absence of God, lack of God's interest in answering prayers or even death of their God. The Lord is a shepherd to his people. Micah chapter 7 verses 11 to 14. Here the picture changes to an announcement by the priest or a prophet of a temple liturgy telling them to rebuild their fallen walls. It is a call to rebuild the ancient walls and to enlarge their national ancient boundaries. People can be, can be seen as a flock with God shepherding over them again. Here a time of restoration can be seen which will take place after the exile. Thirdly, the Lord is God over the nations. Mika chapter 7 verses 15 to 17. Here again, Zion speaks confidently, anticipating restoration of their nation in sight of other nations and punishment of other nations. Verse 15 links their coming out of exile with Exodus, where God showed his wonders, assuring that he is the same. God is still with them and is powerful as before. When the nations will see the coming of the Messiah, they will be amazed. It reflects God's sovereignty in all history. Fourthly, the Lord is the one and only Savior. Chapter 7 verses 18 to 20. Micah describes the Lord as the light in the darkness, the shepherd to his people, the judge and God over the nations. So now he exclaims, who is like our God? Because he does two things. He pardons our sins and forgives our transgressions. And he is the God of chesed love, which is his covenantal love. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. The sins of Israel will be lost from the memory of God forever. But he demands that Israel shows the same love and mercy towards others. Here we end the study on the prophetic book of Micah. We will meet again with another prophetic book. Bye for now. God bless you.